This week we carry on in our series on, on uh, would the real Jesus please stand up? <coughs> you know, we, we have this, this kind of view of Jesus uh, that's a nice tame Jesus. Sometimes our view of Jesus has been conformed and, and, and formed by our society. Um, you know, just thinking of that song and just thinking what we've just done. And thinking back to, to South Africa, a view of Jesus they tried to form in terms of Christian nationalism. In other words, the nation is more important. Uh, in fact, our, our old national anthem, I couldn't sing because the last words were, Ons sal leve, ons sal sterve, ons for you, South Africa. I will live, I will die for you, South Africa. In other words, giving a total allegiance to a nation that belongs to Jesus. And that's the problem. We, we live in a world that tries to form Jesus into a tame lion, into a tame Narnia, into a tame picture of who he is. And we've been looking at this series of the real Jesus stand up, is that we will... Um, See Jesus actually as he really is. Not gentle Jesus, meek and mild, but the radical Jesus. The Jesus um, who has not created in our image, <coughs> but who created the universe. <coughs> and we focus on Luke chapter 4, 18 and 19. Because this passage is Jesus' own self-understanding. It's how he understands his mission. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And remember what we said in the first week, that Jesus goes into the, te uh, the synagogue, gets given the scroll. He doesn't read the part that he's been given, that the steward would have given. He moves the scroll on and he comes to this part. And then he says, if you read the passage in Luke chapter 4, he says, this is fulfilled in your sight, in your hearing, sorry. And Jesus in doing that, identifies himself as the Messiah. You see, this was a promise in Isaiah 61 of the Messiah coming, of the one who is to come, the future, the hope that we have, the restoration of the kingdom of David. And Jesus self-identifies as that. Can we have the next slide? He he comes to proclaim good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom of the captives, recovery of sight of the blind, set the oppressed freed, and the year of the Lord's favor. It's actually quite interesting. Remember the, the little incident where Jesus is going around doing the stuff, as it were? And the disciples of John, the Baptist, come to him. They've been sent by John. Now, John baptized him, and remember the prophetic word? He says, you know, there's the man, and, you know, this is it. You know, I, I need to be baptized by you, and that whole interaction. John's in prison. And he sends a message. Are you really the Messiah? Are you, or must we wait for another one? And what does Jesus say to them? He shows them, or points to, those things, the healings, the freedom, the, you see, this was the son of the Messiah. And we under, have to understand it, in, as, as we said, in the, in the context of Second Temple Judaism. Second Temple Judaism was a time of expectancy, of God breaking through, of the prophetic, not of... Um, a nice diplomatic thing. But this king would come and destroy those who are oppressing us and set us free. And that's the context in which this radical man comes and starts saying, this is fulfilled in your hearing. 
He's not a gent- he's he, he he's not a tame lion. <laughs> but he is kind. He is good. And you see, this is when he says, and we're going to be focusing today on proclaiming recovery of sight to the blind. Now we could pr- preach a very shallow sermon and point to all the times he does healings and f- the physical side, which he did. He f- healed. I mean, just think of the story of Blind Bart. You know, you know Blind Bart? You know, he's the guy with the jacket and he shouts, Jesus! And everybody tells, tries to tell him to shut up. Jesus! And eventually Jesus says to them, tell him to come here. And he throws off his jacket and runs and is healed. There's many stories of healing, of physical healing. And in fact, Jesus would preach the kingdom of God and then demonstrate it with healings. The physical healing was an act of compassion, declaring the kingdom and demonstrating it. And it's a highlight of God's compassion and power and restoring physical sight. But I want to go deeper. I want to talk about the spiritual blindness that he came to bring us freedom from. You see, even in the uh, Jewish world, there was in that time a spiritual blindness. They had become so caught up in the laws and rituals and regulations. Jesus weeps over Jerusalem because the people had been oppressed by the priests and the Sadducees and the Pharisees. They had to fulfill all these laws and they could never do it. And he weeps. And he says, come to me all who are heavy laden and I will give you rest. You see, when we have this spiritual blindness that comes, when we buy into religion rather than Jesus, there's a number of things that happen. I think the first thing is we're not able to see our identity in Christ. You know, when Christ says we are seated at the right hand of the Father, we say, no, that's, that's for others, not for me. You know, that's for the super spiritual, not for me. There's a veil that comes over our eyes. In fact, in the prayer meeting beforehand, uh, somebody prayed, um, Lord, may we not replace the veil that you've already torn apart. Jesus, you know, at the death, the, the temple, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, curtain was torn from top to bottom. Now, how did that happen? I think that little detail reminds us that it was actually God that did it. That suddenly our access to the inner holy of holies was assured. And the problem is with religion, we try and sew that back and say, no, I can't enter that place. And we end up with this place of hopelessness. Because that's what it is when you have legalism. Because guess what? You can never fulfill the law. You try and fulfill the laws. Yeah. And so, you walk around with this heavy feeling of guilt and failure. I want to say to you this morning, if you are struggling with that, if you have that heavy feeling of 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 hopelessness. If you do not understand your identity in Christ, if you know that you have a veil over your eyes, that you cannot see into the Holy of Holies, Jesus proclaims sight to the blind. N.T. Wright, who's the, 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 the um, 
was the Bishop of Durham. He's a well-known uh, theologian. says, just as Jesus healed the physically blind, he opens the eyes of our hearts to see God's truth. Or Richard Foster, who, you know, the C Celebration of Discipline, who's read that book? You know, he puts it this way. Spiritual blindness keeps us from experiencing the fullness of God's presence and revelation. When we bar that veil again, we give away the fullness of his revelation in our lives. You know, Jesus talks to a church about this, and that's the Laodicean church. Uh, in Revelation chapter 3. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither hot nor cold. Would, would that you were either hot or cold. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich. And in white garments, so that you may clothe yourselves. And the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. And solve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sit down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is an interesting rebuke to the church. He says, I know your works. This church was probably a good church at doing good works. You know, they were doing all the stuff. But with that had come a pride. You see, what you've got to understand about the church in Laodicea is Laodicea was a crossroads city. It was a wealthy city, a trading city. And they had a special dye that they could produce this cloth. And so it was, you know, good trade. They had a, a salve a, 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 that, that, that was supposed to be good for healing eyes. They were prosperous. I have need for nothing. What does Jesus say about that? I counsel you to buy from me gold. Refined by fire. In other words, pure. White garments so that you may clothe yourself. In other words, what, the, what they were producing... Yes, physically might have been quite great, but they were naked, poor, and blind. And a soul to anoint your eyes. I want you to see in this passage, he's writing to Christians. Let's face it, okay, hands up who's either preached it or heard a sermon, behold, I stand at the door and knock to unbelievers. Huh? I've preached it. I've preached it. Huh? Guilty. But he's writing to Christians, to a church, and saying, Behold, I stand at the door. You see, the church in Laodicea had become very religious. They did good works, but they did not know Jesus. As Mark 14, 4, 4, 19 says, the deceitfulness of wealth and desires for things came, come in and choke 
the word. That's the, that's the passage. You remember the, the sowing of the seed and the, the thorns come up? And Jesus' explanation is that all these other things grow up and choke the real word. May we hear Joshua's call. Choose this day who you're going to worship. When we sung that song earlier, all my idols, my flags, all of that stuff, when I lay it down for the real king, That's the challenge to each and every one of us this morning. And this is the radical nature of Jesus. You know, Jesus doesn't actually like to share the throne with anything. I don't know if you know that. He doesn't share the throne with us, you know. And he doesn't share the throne with our nationalism or our, you know, racism or our, you put ever what ism you want in there. He is either or. He's radical in that way. And he is calling us back to himself. Dallas Willard says, seeing with the eyes of faith leads to transformation and spiritual growth. In other words, our lives will be transformed when our eyes are opened. Uh, Eugene Peterson, who wrote the, the, the Message Bible, puts it like this. Through scripture, prayer, and guidance of the Holy Spirit, we can gain spiritual clarity and insight. And that leads me into the, the thing of, well, what do you do? The ho-hum of every sermon. You know, you've got to have a ho-hum. So what does this mean for you, for me? I think the first thing, and I hope you're catching it week by week, is we have to buy in that this Jesus we serve is radical. He is not a tame lion. He is radical. And in that, we need to see his identity in these words, how he sees himself. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news to the poor, to set the captives free. In other words, Jesus was coming and came to turn society upside down. Is that the nice tame Jesus? that the politicians would want us to serve? You can serve him as long as you don't interfere. Is that the nice tame Jesus? That the people who say things like, oh, I, I think he was just a moral man. You know? He was just a good man. <laughs> no. He was much much more. Sorry, let me change the tense there. He is much, much more. You see, he challenges our norms and expectations. He challenged them back then. I mean, let's face it, how many times didn't he, well, throw tables over, call the Pharisees a bunch of uh, white sepulchers, you know, how to win friends and influence people. <laughs> Can you imagine the disciples walking with Jesus and he suddenly starts ranting at some uh, Pharisee, you know, uh, you whitewashed sepulchres, you know, gravestones. The disciples, oh Jesus, don't, can't you just tone your words down a little bit? No. No. 
And this message of recovery of the sight to the blind is a call to the church today. That we have become so blind to the gospel. To the radical nature of what we do. That we are not meant to conform to this world, but be countercultural. It reminds me of that, that bishop, I can't remember his name, Ramirez, I think it was, who said, You know, when, when I give food to the poor, you say I'm a saint. But when I ask why they're poor, you say I'm a communist. Whereas Bishop Desmond Tutu put it, he said, I'm tired of pulling bodies out of the river. I want to go up the stream to see why they're falling in. You see, and I think that's the gospel message. We see things, we're moved by the Holy Spirit in a certain area in our lives. And we're not just there to put a plaster on it, but we are called to take the blindness on the veil of for us and say, Lord, what are you calling me to in this area? What are you saying about my life in this area? How can I make a difference in this area? Suddenly, I'm no longer blinded by the, by the conformity to this world. But the church is transformed to making a difference. All of us have spiritual blindness. You know, John spoke two weeks ago. And he had that picture of the temple. And talking about the inclusivity of, you know, that the, um, the religion had put the woman outside. And the, you know, the Gentile had to be in the court round and about. And it was only a very few that got in. And then only one went into the Holy of Holies. God tears that curtain. And it's for everyone. Suddenly, everyone is included. There's no barriers. So I want to encourage you. Engage in scripture and prayer. What is God's Holy Spirit saying to you? Lord, remove the blindness from my eyes. What are you saying to me, Lord? Where have I bought conformity to religion? And second radical nature is live in your identity. I am a son, I am a daughter of the living God. Not arrogance, but I know who I am. That I don't excuse myself for being a Christian. You know, we, we, I've had a couple of instances here in this building where people have said, oh, no, 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 um, we, we can't have it in a church because people won't come into a church. And my response to that is I'm not going to be apologized for being a Christian church. We are a church. Full stop. The building's available to people, but we're a church. We're not going to apologize for that. I don't apologize for being a Christian. Start doing some practical things. Seek mentors. And it might be reading certain books. People who might speak into your life. That'll help you gain a backbone, as it were. <laughs> to do the stuff God is calling you to do. And then, just do it. Pray for the sick. Reach out to the lost. Be inclusive. Include people. Because that's what we call to be. You know, the heart of Jesus was, the, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever should believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. He came not to condemn the world is the next verse. We forget to read this next verse on this one. You know, we read John 3, 16. 
He came not to condemn, but to save. Now the interesting thing about that word world, we automatically translate that in our minds to he loved people. And then we, we narrow it down, people that look like me. People that act like me. But actually, the word is cosmos. The whole of creation. So yes, the people might not look like you. Sorry. Sorry for you. But he came to save the whole of creation. And Romans 8 says, and the whole of creation stands, and as N.T. Wright puts it, on tiptoes, waiting for the revelation of the sons and daughters of God. Oh, that we would be the real sons and daughters of God, that creation actually celebrates that we hear. And we don't buy the right-wing uh, evangelical mindset that says, oh, this world's going to get destroyed anyway, so let's abuse it. Let's, you know. Because that's actually, there's an organization called Heartland Institute, and that's the theology they push. Guess who they're funded by? Any guesses? Huh? Wow, how did you guess? <laughs> Friends, oh, that the whole of creation would celebrate us. Amen?